Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Aperio Teaching and Learning meeting. Today is Wednesday, March the 6th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and I I will be facilitating this call. I can't hear you anymore, Matt, though, if you're talking. Can you guys hear me now? I was hearing you, Matt. Okay, so we'll blame that on Laura Geckler's equipment, which is often malfunctioning. So thanks a lot, Laura. Anyway, we're glad to have you here with us today for our installment of the Aperio Teaching and Learning meeting. Uh, today, we're gonna be hearing a presentation from Tiffany Stoll, my colleague here at UVA, along with John Buckingham from Pepperdine, who are gonna talk about a new proposal for an enhancement to the auto groups feature. Before we do that, we always take a few minutes to dive in and talk about some project updates and announcements. So if you have uh, updates or announcements about any ongoing projects throughout the Aperio community, now is the time to come on the mic or post those updates in the chat. So we'll take a few minutes here for those updates now. Hi, this is Wilma. Um, so you probably saw the email. Um, Sakai 12.6 was released yesterday. So that's out there now if, um, if folks are still on the on 12.5 and they want to upgrade. Um, there's quite a few fixes in 12.6. Uh, it was a fairly large release. Um, so, uh, and there were actually some user facing items that were added as part of this maintenance release. Um, so I would check out the, um, the release notes and um, I'll paste those into the chat here in just a second. I don't have the URL handy, but um, so that's out there and um, 19 we hope to get out um, by the end of this month still um, we're still hoping to get the general release out by the end of, of March right now we're still in release candidate one but we're hoping to um, to get release candidate two out next week um, so fingers crossed that um, that that will happen and we'll be able to to um, stay on track to get 19 out by the end of the month Awesome, that sounds great. Thanks, Wilma. So this is this is Josh. Just a quick update from the marketing team. About a week ago, we, put, we published Sakai News to the SakaiLMS.org website. So the idea is to try and publish one to two news articles a month and do that for a year. I mean, it's not the, uh, the highest bar ever, but uh, consistency is a good start. So I'd absolutely welcome anyone who has a teaching and learning related blog post or article that they've written that might be good to feature for the community in Sakai News, definitely get in touch because we're we're starting to feature those. We've got uh, one coming up from Dave Eveland at Johnson University and others as well. So, uh, so please get in touch if you've got something that you've written that you'd like to get some broader play for. And Wilma has posted the release info for 12.6 in the chat. So thank you, Wilma, for posting that link so that people can check that info out. There's also a question here from Laura Sierra, Josh, about whether we should show the website or at least point people to the website, which is now sakailms.org. I think that's a great idea. I'll, I'll toss the, uh, the URL in the chat. So thanks for that suggestion, Laura. That's a great idea. And people, please feel free to check out that news portion. Of course, as this project continues to move forward, we'll want to hear more and get more news from all of your various institutions. We know that you all have great people doing great things with Sakai, and we want to hear about those things because we want to put those things in front of everyone uh, in the ed tech community so that they can see the kinds of awesome things that Sakai is partnering with every day. So please check that out. And while you check that out, think about whether you've got some news that you might want to share with us, um, either in written form or just in notes. And Tiffany's got a note here in the chat about the possibility of changing the time for the accessibility working group meeting. Uh, Tiffany, do you want to talk, talk about that briefly? Uh, sure. Yeah, we have some folks who um, haven't been able to, to attend recently because of other uh, commitments at uh, 4 p.m. on uh, Wednesdays or 4 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesdays. So we're going to be discussing uh, potentially changing the meeting time and, you know, if it's better for other people, uh, potentially even the day. Uh, so that discussion is going on today, this 
this afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, if you have a meeting time you'd prefer, send me an email, and I put my email in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to propose other times, days of week. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. The Accessibility Working Group is really one of the most important groups that we have here at Sakai. If you haven't been a part of one of those meetings, they do really good and really important work there. So feel free to send Tiffany an email and check those meetings out and get involved there. Any other updates or announcements that folks want to share before we move on and talk about a couple JIRAs? Okay, seeing none, let's move on and talk about a couple of JIRAs here. We had a request uh, through Wilma from the core team uh, to talk about one and possibly more uh, JIRAs, time permitting, that came up during their most recent core team meetings. And so I've posted the URL for the first of those JIRAs in the chat so that you all can pull that up and take a look at it. It's SAC41328, which is an interim solution for an issue affecting multiple choice, multiple selection questions. Wilma, I think you were in that core team meeting uh, when the core team asked to refer this to us for some discussion. Do you want to add any more context about this JIRA here? Um, basically, the, the idea was uh, to put in sort of an interim solution. Um, the, the appropriate solution um, would take longer, um, but the uh, Brian Jones was the, the person who identified it. Um, he's, he's not going to be able to get enough time from his institution to be able to do the, the do it the right way, essentially. <laughs> so this is kind of a band-aid fix, um, but it's better than not having a warning at all. So um, I'll let you guys kind of read through the, the JIRA itself uh, to see what that means. But basically right now, um, there is no uh, warning. And so they're talking about including one um, just to kind of give people a heads up um, until a more um, proper solution can be developed and implemented. So the idea was usually we don't like to put a Band-Aid on things. We prefer to you know fix the, the underlying problem. But um, I think the core team wanted to get some feedback from this group in that, um, you know, is this something that you guys would prefer to see fixed, you know, with a Band-Aid in the short term? It's been a bug for a while. It's been reported all the way back since version 10. So it's not like it's a new thing that, you know, all of a sudden. So people have been living with this for a while. Is it okay to live with it for a little while longer until, you know, the, the underlying issue can be corrected? Or... Do we slap a band-aid on it? And so, Wilma, first of all, just to make sure that I understand the issue here, the issue is that if you have a test or quiz with questions with multiple choice, multiple selection option enabled, and your scoring option for those is set to all or nothing, which means you have to get all of those multiple selections correct to get any credit. If you import that test or quiz into another site, it changes that scoring setting from all or nothing to correct minus incorrect. Is that right? I just want to make it's, sure I understand. It's only issue. when you import or export it as QTI. So if you're copying from one site to another, um, using the site info, you know, in importing content that way, it comes over just fine because that's within Sakai. It's when you export to um, QTI to transport it somewhere else um, or if you're importing um, it into, you know, another site, um, that's where the problem is because it's with the QTI spec for, for exporting it out of the system. Great, great. Thank you for that context. And we also have a question in the chat from Terry Wilma about whether or not this is addressed in Sakai 19. I don't think this has been addressed no. yet, but I wanted to mm -hmm. make sure. Yeah, it's, it hasn't been addressed at all. It affects um, 19 and tentatively 20 um, because right now nobody's really working on a solution um, 
So the basically the options on the table are just leave it alone. Um, it's been around for a long time and nobody's really been um, motivated to fix it yet or um, at least give people a warning message that it's not going to work. So those are kind of the two options. So we have a comment in the chat from Laura Geckler that the Band-Aid version sounds like a message that would need to appear in multiple places. So when exporting the QTI, uh, maybe when you're working an import from site and when you're selecting that question type. Uh, so is well, that import from thing? site is not affected. Import okay. from site doesn't have this issue. Um, and selecting the question type, I don't think you would need it because it's only if you export it as QTI that you run into the issue. So the question type itself is going to work. And if you copy it into another Sakai site on the same instance, it's also going to work. OK, so the core team is not really asking about where this should be included in the UI so much as whether or not we need this in the UI at all. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So to provide a little more background, this is something that I discovered in testing our 11 upgrade at UVA. And so we put this notification in place, um, I don't know, a little over a year ago or two uh, to uh, make people aware of it. I don't, we haven't actually had it reported by any users. Um, so, you know, it, it hasn't been gravely noticed, I don't think, but uh, you know, I think it's helpful to have the message there just in case. So we also have a comment in the chat from Terry Golightly who says that if UVA at least has something like the Band-Aid in place, it's needed even if there's not been a great outcry. Um, we also have some comments uh, from Laura Geckler that there might be too many annoying error messages uh, in the system already. I can certainly understand that. It's a fine line between the error messages that you need and the error messages that are annoying and just make you want to slap the screen. So that's definitely something we want to think about as well. Any other initial reactions or thoughts about this JIRA? Um, well, counting it as an error message, it's not quite an error message because it's similar to the message that already exists for um, the, uh, what is that question type, the image map, where it says on the page you can't import image maps, you know, correctly or whatever that message is. I don't know what the text is, uh, but uh, it's, it's basically in the same place as that that's already existing on the import page. And we have a comment in the chat from Aaron, Adam Howarwas who says that it's a precautionary statement. Um, in his opinion, telling people there's a potential future issue is better than not informing them and then having them run into that issue uh, at a later point. And that's a good point, Adam. Uh, I think that's something that we need to consider as well. Is a better solution to um, roll the two messages together? as uh, these question types are not supported by the QTI standard? And then further that's, explain what that means. That's what I was suggesting, was putting it in the same place as the other message. Now, at UVA, we don't have that question type enabled, so that message does not exist here. But um, yeah. yeah, no, I wasn't thinking of two separate messages, but one message. Yeah, as part of that same I mean, the, the sentences for this could be added along with that that line. Yeah, I would tend to edit them both so that um, people see them as one problem, and that is that it's not really a problem, actually. We have more question types than are supported by the QTI standard. <laughs> That's right. We have a plethora of options. Well, I think that... Um, Originally, when this question type was created, there was no uh, correct minus incorrect or you know whatever they call it, uh, le right, less wrong um, option. And so it was just all or nothing, as I recall. And then the other one was added. And so whichever one appears first in the list of options, I think is the one that 
gets selected by default on import. And I think that the first one listed is the correct minus incorrect, and that's why it comes up on import rather than the all or nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So it sounds like folks are generally in favor of having a warning message. Is that correct? I'd, I'd call it an informational message, or as Adam Hauerwas says, a precautionary statement. Right. Okay. So I will. I'll add a note to that, um, letting the the core team know that that people would prefer to have a heads up as opposed to nothing and and the fact that the two messages should be wordsmith to be just one okay yeah i based on this i can't really tell where this message would appear so i don't know if maybe that's where he intended to put it or not um but uh i'll add that in the comment thanks wilma Thanks, Wilma. We have a little bit more uh, in the chat from Heather uh, saying that if we can't get it fixed in the next version, an info statement would be good. So another endorsement for the info statement there. And then we also have an excellent suggestion from Adam that we can put it next to a button that says, don't push this button, uh, which <laughs> everyone else's <laughs> faculty or anything like our faculty will guarantee that they push it. They're kind of like five-year-olds in that way. Mm -hmm. They're going to push that button. <laughs> So thank you all for that discussion, and thank you, Wilma, for sharing that with us uh, and for offering to take that feedback back to the JIRA uh, so that the core team can move forward accordingly. That's excellent. And just one more logistical note before we dive into our main presentation here. Uh, Laura Sear has posted in the chat uh, that Jolie has posted a reminder about the UX call, um, which immediately follows this one at 11 a.m. Eastern in Big Blue Button Room 3. Um, so if you're interested in uh, UI, UX stuff, we've been doing some great work on that in Sakai. And uh, Jolie and Sean have really been leading that charge along with others. And so please check that call out uh, right after this one at 11 AM Eastern in Big Blue Button Room 3. But now I think we're ready to dive into our main presentation and uh, hear from Tiffany and John about their proposal for some enhancements to auto groups. So Tiffany, I think I've given you screen sharing privileges. All right. So take it away whenever you're ready. All right, looks like it's doing something. Um, so uh, I think this uh, link is in the uh, agenda. Yes, for um, John has uh, developed a document and, and I've helped with that. Uh, John, do you want to say a couple words? Um, well, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, Tiffany, I wanted to thank Tiffany so much for, for helping with uh, this document and of course with this presentation. We've, uh, Tiffany and I have worked kind of very closely over the past couple of weeks to develop this document um and uh you know we hope that it's that it's um uh, it's very clear and concise and so um don't have too many comments but uh, i'm really really hoping and, and eager to uh get everybody's feedback yeah so um the issue that that we've encountered and we were both working with faculty uh who encountered this issue is that there's this auto groups feature you may be familiar with it that allows an instructor or a um, site administrator to automatically create groups at random from members of their site. Um, now, the issue for instructors is that if they have a large class with multiple uh, sections or rosters, um, they may want to create a group of, say, students from a particular roster. So in a class with like a, a large lecture class with multiple discussion sections, Let's say they want to create forums for each class's students. So they want to create groups of students from just a specific roster. And the problem is that uh, the auto groups feature does not allow you to do that currently. So there are these two options. Let me get to a site and I can show you here. And I'll zoom in on my screen so you can see a little bit better. 
Can everyone see this? Yep, you are good to go. All right. So the auto groups feature is uh, Insight Info Manage Groups. And um, when I go here in my site with multiple rosters, you can see there are checkboxes. So I can create groups from rosters. I say, okay, let's say I want groups of students from both discussion section one and discussion section two. Okay, that looks good. And I want students. And so these are checkboxes. So I assume that if I select the two rosters and then I select students, I'm going to get all students in those rosters randomly assigned to groups. So let's say, so here I have an option to create a single group from the selected role. Well, I don't want a group of just all students, single group. I want random groups from members in that role. So I say, okay, I want a uh, working group and I want two groups maybe. And I can also choose to split by the number of students per group. So if I click add here, what happens is I end up with groups of every roster, basically. So first of all, it's creating groups for the rosters, <laughs> which is not necessary. Um, this was the top part of the option, the top checkbox. Set. So it creates two groups, one group per roster, including instructors and administrators and all that stuff. And then it creates the two groups of students, and this is all students from all rosters. So it's not narrowing down, I want students from those two rosters I selected. Instead, it's creating groups of rosters and groups of students. And even worse, when I go into one of these groups of the roster, this is what I get a section under the group member list. So basically, this is the same behavior as if I had created a manual group and selected section and moved it to the group member list and then click Save. I mean, in this case, I'm editing the group. But you can see it's not very effective. <laughs> um, so this is the problem that our instructors were facing, was that they wanted to create groups of specific um, stu you know, students from specific rosters and filter them out. And another problem that they had was um, that they wanted to create groups from the role student, but then if they were doing it from, you know, student, then they would get students from all rosters. If they were doing it from roster, they would get members, all members from the roster, including instructors, teaching assistants, and other types of members. And so then they have to go through and manually remove all those users who were added as extra members to the groups after the fact. In some cases, they don't realize that. And um, you know, additionally, they then have to redistribute the members of the groups to make sure they're equal uh, after they remove all of those affected uh, users. So um, what we were proposing was to rework this um, this feature so that we can allow the instructors um, to create a group, you know, from the selected rosters and from the selected roles to filter them down. So the first option, creating a single group of all participants for each roster, uh, that's really not needed because a roster already behaves like a group in Sakai. So we were proposing to take that away and just you know, putting some kind of text or tip saying, you don't need to do that. Uh, so then the second uh, situation, we thought there, it might be helpful to have some kind of tip for situations where instructors would need to create uh, multiple sets of auto groups or, you know, use the auto groups function uh, more than once to, um, you know, for example, to assign a single teaching assistant to each group of students or something like that, where you'd have to do some manual editing after the fact, because you couldn't say, you know, I, I definitely want you know, one teaching assistant assigned to each of these groups. That would get very complicated in the coding, and you may have fewer teaching assistants than groups and so on. Uh, so the, the new um, workflow functionality uh, was that we suggested to switch, we're suggesting to switch the roles and rosters um, sections of the page. So first you have checkboxes to select 
which roles you want the groups from. Um, because in most cases, you're going to want just students or just instructors or just teaching assistants. But you might want students mixed with teaching assistants or something like that. Uh, at UVA, we also have waitlisted students. So the, one of the instructors I was working with wanted students and waitlisted students to be mixed up into groups. And he couldn't do that um, automatically. So you select the roles, and then you can choose to limit uh, the groups to specific rosters or, and or users who were manually added to the site. And in this case, it's like unenrolled students who were auditing, um, you know, in some cases, teaching assistants who were added manually without being on the official roster. So we also added an option for including the manually added users. They're not currently treated um, in the group section as a roster because they're not on a roster. But if that's possible to sort of group them together as a subsection of the site, um, we thought that might be helpful to be able to select those users. And then uh, the other option is to include all users in that role, you know, all students, regardless of what their roster is. So then after that, we get to defining the group membership structure. And we thought that some language here would be helpful uh, to, you know, sort of outline what's going to happen when this is done. Because right now, it's just like split by number of groups needed and number of users per group. So we thought that because we want, um, you know, the possibility of splitting these up into specific rosters or, or right, um, specifying the rosters afterwards, um, we'd like the system to say, you know, these are the selected roles that we're going to create groups from. So I want a group of students, a group of teaching assistants, and so on. Uh, and then the other option being your standard, you know, current option, creating a group with a random mix of users from all the roles, uh, and then you split by the number of groups or uh, users per group. And so we listed in the document some different possible uh, scenarios we thought of that would lead to these different workflows. Uh, you know, random mix of all members from a specific roster, including the instructors and TAs, uh, groups by role, so instructors, students, and teaching assistants uh, as individual groups, a random mix of students and waitlisted students, or students on a roster and students not on a roster, uh, random mix of students, yeah, both from the roster and, and not, so including some who were not officially enrolled and some who are on specific roster only, uh, and then uh, two sets of groups, one with a random mix of students from one section and one with a random mix of students from another section. And so, you know, in in some cases, we were aware that you know there are things that need to be done manually, so the workflow may need to be repeated on a per roster basis. So a group of students in roster A and a separate group of students in roster B. And then we also um, included the uh, project site or course site that doesn't have a roster uh, possible workflow. So in this case, you would just select the roles uh, from which to create the groups. And then you would define the group membership structure uh, as above. So that's uh, what we have proposed. And we wanted some input as to uh, what you guys think. Great. So we have uh, some comments here in the chat uh, from Heather that that makes sense. It looks like the roles are or statements and the rosters are and statements. So reordering and adding manually added users should be helpful. Um, Jennifer comments that she likes being able to sort by rosters because if you have combined rosters, you can make them have their own groups for grading. Um, and she also appreciates the uh, project sites um, were included here. Obviously, I think project sites are something that we don't often uh, get a lot of play when we talk about teaching and learning in Sakai, but are something that is a very significant feature for Sakai because it's a feature that a lot of other LMS options don't offer. 
Um, so it's great that as we continue to think about new and better features uh, that can affect our course sites, we can also think about how those new and better features uh, can impact our collaboration sites. Oh, I just also wanted to ask real quick, um, and I just wanted to coordinate with uh, Tiffany on this. Uh, you know, we obviously we want to be able to take notes and we want to be able to make sure that we get everybody's feedback um, because, you know, this this did require a lot of rehashing and it really, you know, it, it's 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 it was actually it's very, very difficult to kind of crisscross all of these possible scenarios um, and kind of think about all the possible ways that a professor might need to think about this or, or try to tackle you know what their ultimate objective in mind is and so you know i i don't know i'm thinking here tiffany that we might also want to ask people to feel free to add comments um here to the shared document um you know in case there's if there's any places that are uh you know not clear or anything that might need to be thought a little bit more through um but, uh, you know, I, I think everyone might already have the ability to add comments. So I just wanted to make sure that that's kind of currently in place. Yeah, yeah, we, um, I did enable, I think, the option to add comments. So yeah, anyone who can access this document, the link uh, can comment. So yeah, feel free to do that, please. And yeah. uh, let us yeah. know. And it, and it really, you know, I mean, you know, Tiffany did a, a really great presentation. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, it might even just take, you know, a minute, you know, again, we had to really think about this and it, and it, and it takes some time to really digest all of this. And so, um, yeah, please feel free to take a look at the document and, you know, we're totally open for questions and, um, you know, how, how best to move forward. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, John, for suggesting that. And I think that is probably the best way mm -hmm. uh, for folks to share their feedback with you all as, as you uh, prepare this proposal for a uh, farm presentation or for another presentation. Are you all thinking about bringing this to farm at this point or what are your next steps here, do you think? Um, well, we have a JIRA open uh, re related to this and I think we probably want to refine that uh, and I'm not sure where we want to go from there, John. <laughs> yeah, well, we, you know, we did create a JIRA, um, and, you know, it just so happened that as the JIRA started kind of snowballing, uh, we, we figured, oh, well, maybe it might be best to create a Google Doc, um, you know, uh, to kind of capture all of the, 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 the snowballing effect that was happening. Um, you know, as far as moving forward, again, I would like to see if maybe we could get um, everyone's feedback from here. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'll, I'll admit, I'm actually a little bit new kind of to the, the Aperio structure. So um, I'm not quite sure who, who next we would need to, um, to go to, but I imagine that, you know, we, we would probably want to get as much feedback as we could before we we went and asked for a, a final quote on this project. Absolutely, John, I think that sounds good. Um, Aperio has a project called Farm, um, which can provide uh, small seed funding for uh, smaller projects and feature requests and feature enhancements like this one, and this might be a nice candidate for that. And I will post uh, the link to the farm website in the chat so that folks can check that out if they haven't checked it out already. But that might be one option for you all to consider. Um, and I think that Pepperdine is also a long site school, so perhaps if you guys have leftover long site dollars, uh, this might be um, where you decide to allocate them if people get excited about this feature. Obviously, I don't want to speak for you, but I just think that could be another option. Uh, if everyone gets really excited about this feature. Yeah, and of course, you know, again, we're, we're, we're always looking for ways to partner with, with other schools in terms of, uh, you know, splitting the, the cost and, and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, obviously we hope that this is, this, this is an exciting feature and, and that other schools um, are interested by it because I really do think that there is a, a tremendous use case. I mean, we've gotten we've gotten a lot of professors who have kind of come to us and say, "Hey, why you know, why doesn't it do this? Why doesn't it do that?" Um, so it, it it I I really do think it's a it's a really um, high value um, uh, proposal. 
Absolutely. And I think that those can make some of the best use cases for Sakai or for any ed tech tool when faculty can come to you and say, you know, I had this issue with my course where I wanted to do X and I met with my ed tech professionals and they solved it for me. You know, I think those are, are very powerful and very compelling stories. And this is a case where we could do that for some faculty at institutions throughout the world. So that's kind of a cool thing. Josh is asking in the chat whether we have an estimate of development time required for this proposal. Uh, Tiffany and John, have you guys had a chance to think about that, or are you all still in the exploratory phase at this point? Well, neither of us is a developer, so <laughs> um, yeah, there is that. Um. I will, yeah, real quick, I will say that uh, we had originally um, asked Longsight about um, a quote, but that was for a you know before this 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 kind of snowballed here. So, uh, <laughs> so I imagine that that quote will probably have have changed. Uh, so you know, as of right now, we we do not have um, a proposal on the current state of what you all see right here. Uh, so, so to answer your question, we're kind of still on that exploratory phase. Excellent. That makes perfect sense. So I posted a couple of links to Tiffany and John's Google Doc in the chat. So please feel free to check out that Google Doc, uh, go through it, uh, look at uh, some of the use cases that they've outlined. They've done a really nice job of outlining the current state of the problem. Um, and providing you with that context before they move on to talk about their proposed solutions. So check out that document um, and make any comments um, that you think would be helpful there in the document. And then uh, Tiffany and John will have that information there as they continue to refine this proposal and think about the best ways to move it forward. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I'm 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 real, real quick, Tiffany. Do we want to ask for perhaps a date by which everyone could uh, take a look? Would that would that be helpful? Um, sure. I, do you have a date in mind? <laughs> well, you know, I I know that everyone's. I I mean, I'm sure everyone's real busy, but of course, we want to. You know, we want to make sure we keep the ball rolling here. So. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, I can throw out a date. Uh, obviously, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone will, will be okay with it. But uh, I'm thinking either by Friday the the 15th or even the 22nd of March. I don't know. Is that are either of those dates too soon? Um, Sounds good know. to me. We might want to uh, send an email to the list too, and just let right. people know that we have this document. Right. Yeah. I, again, we just we just really want to keep the ball the ball rolling on this so that we can, um, you know, we can ultimately uh, get a solution. So, I think that sounds good, John. I think that since you all aren't in a time crunch at this point, I might suggest the twenty second just to give folks a little bit more time to comment. Also, we're getting into the time of year. It is spring break season for many of us. Uh, UVA is on spring break next week. I know many other folks are on spring break in March, and so that can mess with schedules a little bit. So maybe if you guys want to shoot for a comment deadline of Friday the 22nd, that will give people plenty of time to dive in, uh, give their comments. You all can send an email reminder to the list um, to prompt people before that deadline occurs, and then you'll hopefully have some feedback to take this to the next level. Sounds great. great. Yeah, I think that sounds very reasonable. Um, that sounds that sounds great to me. Awesome. Any final comments or questions for Tiffany and John about this proposal? All right. Well, thank you all again uh, so much for taking some time to share this with us. Uh, we've seen nothing but plus ones, which is always <laughs> a sign of a good presentation, that people are excited about it and want it to continue moving forward, and that we see thanks to you for advancing this instead of I had to get up and go do something else. So it's always nice uh, to see that in the chat because it means that 
the proposals on track and uh, you guys are doing good work uh, that's interesting and compelling to a lot of people. So we have just a few more minutes here, and since we have a few more minutes, uh, we have some other JIRAs that Wilma shared with us uh, that were mentioned in the most recent core team meetings as JIRAs uh, on which they would like some teaching and learning group input. And so I'm going to post the first of those in the chat right here. Uh, actually, uh, three four two 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 is um, is is linked to that original issue that we talked about already. That's the um, the JIRA that documents the problem with the export. The other JIRA was one about um, adding that, um, the warning message. And so this JIRA, Wilma, is the JIRA to actually resolve the problem with the QTI import-export. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So I think okay. we've kind of already covered this one. Um, yeah. So we can yeah, skip that it. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I think that we can skip it. Um, Based on that info, thank you, Wilma. I think that the only thing we need to say about this is that uh, if you agree um, with Tiffany and Terry and some other folks that this is a loophole that we should probably close, I would encourage you to go over to that JIRA and vote that up um, and leave your comments there uh, to indicate that this is an issue that you feel uh, should be prioritized because I think that information, that feedback is usually really helpful uh, to the core team and to the developers in determining how resources should be allocated. So if you're interested in this feature being fixed uh, going forward instead of band-aided, uh, as we may do uh, going forward, please feel free to check out that JIRA and leave your comments and votes there. So now I will post the second of our three JIRAs in the chat. And this is SAC uh, 41210, um, which is a feature request uh, to suggest uh, previous inputs uh, when entering feedback in the gradebook. Um, so for example, if you've entered a comment um, with some text feedback for a student, and then you're entering text feedback for another student, that your previous feedback would be suggested there uh, if you begin typing the same words or phrases uh, as you enter that second uh, text feedback. Yeah, you've probably seen this in you know, a lot of web forms now. We'll do that. Um, you know, uh, Google will do that. Um, when you start typing the beginning of it, it'll give you any suggested prior responses. The reason um, that, that the core team kicked this over to, to TNL for some more feedback is that there were some concerns about um, people potentially using shared computers, if there was going to be an issue with somebody, you know, starting to type in the same browser, if the browser cache hadn't been cleared, you know, would it um, start suggesting some of the text from a different person um, and also based on the, the device that you're using it's not going to like save a library of all your comments so if an instructor kind of gets reliant upon um, being able to just pick one of their prior uh, feedback remarks um, and reuse it if they go to a different computer they're not going to have that same list because it's it's stored um, on that device. So just some kind of questions about would this be an inconvenience to people or, or would they naturally accept that because it's kind of like a becoming more common on the web um, and and the um, the issue about potential um, comments uh, lingering on a shared computer in a lab or classroom setting. So Terry has a question in the chat about whether this function functions like autofill. And yes, Terry, it is somewhat similar to that. So for example, if you've ever uh, worked with Google Sheets, uh, for example, if you begin typing a comment into a cell in Google Sheets and then you move to another cell and begin typing the same words or phrases that began your previous comment, they will show up there and be suggested for you to place in that second cell just by pressing the return key. Uh, so I think that's the kind of option that's being suggested here in this JIRA. And actually, if you look in the JIRA comments, um, Miguel Pellicier has added a GIF uh, that shows you what this feature could look like. 
Um, he's kind of mocked it up by integrating a library with a test version of the gradebook. Um, so you can see that there. I originally voiced um, concerns that instructors might confuse it with um, with some of the systems that save your comments to a database and allow you with the library. I think Wilma, Wilma alluded to that. We were on the core team call. But um, autofill is ubiquitous. Uh, I don't think instructors will be surprised when their comments are gone, when that session, when that browser is closed, or if they use, or I'm sorry, the browser cache is emptied or another browser is used. I think that's a good point, Laura. Uh, we also see some similar comments in the chat from Laura Sierra and from Jennifer that. You know, some of the potential issues that Wilma mentioned are potential issues for any application that uses autofill, and therefore I think it might be reasonable to expect that users would expect that behavior. Um, because at this point, as Laura Geckler mentioned, autofill is becoming a little more ubiquitous, and so people are a little more used to it uh, than they were even one to two years ago. Terry commented uh, that the feature kind of depends on two things. Number one, how many times a grader would change browsers or computers, or number two, share computers uh, in terms of having or losing access uh, to those auto-filled or auto-suggested comments. Jennifer comments that she would love this for assignments also. Um, she uses Word docs to put comments and, and copy and paste uh, from that Word document to the assignments comments. So. Um, she would like to see this feature uh, in assignments. Um, and Tiffany's commenting in the chat that she's curious about whether this feature has been vetted uh, for keyboard screen reader accessibility. I think obviously that's something that we will have to do at some point during this process. I don't know if anyone has looked at that at this very initial stage, uh, but I know that that's something that we will definitely do uh, as we do with all features uh, when we bring them into Sakai. And Terry also points out in the chat that autofill is actually recommended um, for WCAG uh, 2.1. Uh, so that's nice to know that this might be something that could even be um, a potential bonus uh, feature for accessibility. Any other thoughts or comments about Stack 41210. Again, if you have comments, if you have interest in this feature, I would definitely encourage you to follow that link, uh, check out the JIRA, uh, vote it up, and also uh, leave your comments there. So would it be a correct assumption to say that the folks here today think that people would kind of get it? They wouldn't... Um be inconvenienced by the fact that it uh, is kind of a per browser, per session sort of thing. OK. All right. Um, I'll add that on the um, as a comment on the JIRA. And it, it looks like, at least my impression is, that people are generally in favor of this one as well. So um, I will go ahead and, and say that, that TNL likes it. Thumbs up. I think that sounds good. We're seeing nothing but yeses and plus ones in the chat. If you have minus ones, speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. I see even more plus ones, so I'm more encouraged. So I'm going to post the link to our final JIRA here in the chat. Uh, this is SAC 40782, uh, which is an issue where uploading uh, grades that contain text feedback into the assignments tool overwrites uh, any student submissions that are in the text box. Wilma, did you want to say anything or provide any additional context about this feature? Um, I actually don't have a whole lot of additional context here other than um, Andrea found this and, um, and labeled it as a blocker because the issue is um, 
that if if people do that, you know, download and then they upload with feedback, it wipes out the original inline submission. And so there was some concern that um, the original submission would be lost. Uh, so I guess the question is, is this um, is this blocker level? Uh, and um, what would be the preferred way of handling um, that kind of thing where you have uh, feedback in line with the student's submission? This is when you um, download it as a, a zip file to grade offline for the assignment tool. Thanks, Wilma. My initial thought off the top of my head is that if there are issues that lead to student data loss, especially potentially irretrievable data loss, then those issues might actually rise to that blocker level. That if there is the potential that a relatively normal action from an instructor can result in data loss, that that does kind of sound like a blocker. But that's just my initial opinion. So I'd definitely be interested to hear what other folks might think. Looks like Terry is agreeing in the chat. And we have some comments also uh, that are similar from Mark and from Adam and from Laura Geckler and from John. So it seems like, Wilma, this does suggest that we kind of think that this might rise to that blocker level. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, that, that would be my instinct as well, but um, we just wanted to get some additional eyes on it. So um, what would happen would, would be there would need to be a functional change in the way those files um, work um, so that it makes some sort of a copy or you end up with two files in there. So, um, so that's why it, it changes the workflow a little bit to ensure that that original inline submission isn't touched. Um, so there's going to, I'm sure, need to be additional work on this um, bug, but I'll go ahead and, and uh, add a comment saying that, that the teaching and learning group thought that um, this was definitely um, you know, blocker level and that the student inline submission should never be lost. That sounds great, Wilma. It seems to me that the kind of work that you're describing would resolve Adam's question that an upload of a zip file should never modify the student data, that the student submission itself uh, should always be preserved. And Adam had some follow-up questions about whether this would change the workflow or change the import process itself. Yes, uh, it will pr probably change the, um, the workflow slightly because right now the files, the way you work with them is if you have that um, file with the student submission, that's the same one that is uh, has the instructor's inline comments. That's why it kind of gets wiped out. So there would need to be some sort of change in there to make those um, kind of stored in two different places. Great. And I think the question about files, yeah, if students uploaded a file, that's different because the, the student file is, is a separate item. Um, it's just the inline submissions that are an issue here. Well, that sounds good. Thank you, Wilma, for taking that feedback back to that JIRA as well. And again, um, if you have thoughts or comments or votes for this issue, uh, please visit that JIRA and uh, vote it up and leave your thoughts there so that the core team and others are aware of your interest in it. So it is now 10.56 and we are almost out of time. Laura Geckler has asked that we talk about one more JIRA. Laura, can we talk about this JIRA in two minutes or do we need to postpone it to next week? What do you think? Uh, probably next week. Okay. That it's sounds be, good. Yeah. That's, I, I don't want to cut you short because I know you have awesome and meaningful things to say. And so I don't want to ring the bell and cut you short. So I will add this to the agenda for our next meeting. 
um, which is actually the week after next Wednesday, March the 20th. And we can dive in and talk about that there. Does that sound good? Well, um, I just looked at the JIRA and realized that Brian Jones has already submitted a pull request, which means that there is a um, suggested solution that he would work on if he got more feedback. So maybe we should take a few minutes for this. Shall I continue or? Um, yes, uh, it's 1057. So I think we want to be as expeditious as possible so that folks can get to other meetings like the UX meeting if they need to. But yes, if we can do this quickly, let's do it. Yeah, me too. So I'm going to put the JIRA in and invite you all to make comments on it because this has to do with the behavior when you duplicate a site of the email archive tool. Um, if your institution uses the funky hash called the UUID for your um, site ID, then that, when you duplicate a site, is currently the duplicate. It does uh, the is currently the email archive address that's put in there by default. So Brian is suggesting putting a different one in, and that is the site title. Um, but we don't, we're not sure what should happen if you happen to put in a site title that already exists on the server. It's not bad if the site has the same title, but um, you couldn't have two email addresses with the same title. So what should that behavior be? Post your comments in the JIRA. Thank you. That was excellent. And with time to spare, Laura Getclear, thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Don't forget to tip your waitresses, everybody. Thank you, Laura. This. Uh, does seem like an issue that would be impactful to a lot of institutions. So again, I would encourage you to check out uh, that JIRA, leave your comments and suggestions there, um, and leave your votes there if you have interest in this issue. And uh, perhaps we can also revisit it uh, in our next meeting at the beginning of the meeting, just to see what comments and thoughts people have about this after they've had some time to reflect on it. Thank you, Matt. All right, so we are almost out of time today. Uh, so I just want to take a moment and remind you about our upcoming meetings. Um, our next meeting will be two weeks from today on Wednesday, March the 20th. Uh, Josh Wilson from Longsight and Karthi Iyer from Infotech will be uh, sharing a proposal on Infotech market research and Sakai. Uh, Infotech uh, is a company that does uh, market research uh, for the tech world and the Sakai community and the Sakai marketing group in particular have been working with them uh, to obtain some really interesting uh, data about how Sakai actually compares uh, with other LMSs and other ed tech products. And so uh, Josh and Karthi and also Wilma uh, will be uh, sharing a presentation uh, of some of that data for us. So please, uh, don't miss it. I think that's going to be really interesting and really helpful for many of us as we think about uh, how Sakai compares to other products now, how we want it to compare to other products going forward. Uh, currently, our meetings in April on Wednesday, April the 3rd, and Wednesday, April the 17th are open. Uh, so if you have suggestions uh, for those meetings, if you have interesting things going on at your schools, if you have interesting topics, please uh, send those topics to Wilma or Tricia or myself. Uh, we'd be happy to talk with you about them, or uh, you may hear from me, one of the others. So head me off. Uh, don't let me come after you. Reach out to us first and uh, share your interesting topics at your institutions with us so that everybody can hear about them and get excited about them with you. And I think that's all the time that we have. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. And we will see you right back here in two weeks uh, to learn more about market research and Sakai. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.